bringing lived experience to family support, the National Federation of Families empowers families whose children experience mental health and or substance use issues by advocating for policies and services that prioritize their lived experiences, ensuring their voices shape national support initiatives. Welcome to Normalize the Conversation. I'm your host, Francesca Regeter, and today I'm joined by Linda Gargan, the Executive Director of the National Federation of Families. Today, we delve into the profound journey of parenthood through Linda's lived experience and her remarkable insights gained along the way. We'll explore how her journey led to her pivotal role advocating for children's mental health and social justice for families. Join us as we highlight the invaluable perspective of recognizing parents and caregivers as experts on their family and the transformative power of person-centered planning. As we commemorate Children's Mental Health Acceptance Week, themed Lighting the Path to Social Justice for Children and Youth, Linda guides us on a journey towards a more inclusive and compassionate future. Linda, thank you so much for joining me for today's conversation. I'm really excited to learn more about the National Federation of Families, your role, and the Children's Mental Health Acceptance Week. But before we begin, I just want to check in. How are you really? Thank you for asking that. We need to ask one another that more often. Um, I am great. This is a great season of my life and spring is almost here. So I am in a wonderful place. How about you? Thank you for asking. I'm so happy you're in such a wonderful place. And honestly, I am too. I'm a bit tired, but very, very grateful for everything that every opportunity I've had and how far I've come from five it's been almost five years since I was hospitalized on a psych ward so to actually look back now and see that growth and change has been amazing and I've been reflecting on that a lot this past week wonderful that's so great to hear Fritz I'm so happy for you thank you I'm really excited to talk about you and your journey and how it led to your role with the National Federation of Families so my journey was an interesting one. Uh, I've worked, I, I'm a psychologist by training. So I have worked in this field my entire life, um, but in a variety of roles, uh, probably most prominently, I worked um, in federal court. I worked class action lawsuits for about 15 years of my life, um, and it was during the deinstitutionalization period, and I was part of a team that would go in and work with individuals who had been institutionalized most of their lives, and we would, through person-centered planning, determine where they wanted to live and how we could support them in their communities. Um, that led to me becoming a mom and working with my wonderful, wonderful son as he navigated some systems also. So I have both that professional and the very personal uh, experience in this work. That brought me to the Federation, and I don't know that there is a better job than uh, being a part of advocating for families across the country who are parenting children who are experiencing mental health and or substance use challenges. You are absolutely incredible. I did not know about you working in the federal circuit of court. That is incredible. And you talked about person-centered planning. For people who don't know what that is, can you give a quick explanation? Oh, I appreciate you asking. Person-centered planning has been around for so very long in its purest form, which is what I am most beholden to. You get to know an individual and you spend time with them. And the question you ask is, what do you want to do with your life? And then you work with them to make their dreams possible. It is truly that simple, but it is also that complex. Because as a professional, I have to give up all of my biases, all of my, what I think is best for you. And I actually have to listen to what you want 
and I have to support you and your community to make that happen. It's incredible how little we think about how different everyone is and that individuality. I know that's something I'm currently learning about in school is how do we account for individual differences and actually make a point to listen to them and to hear them and to not let what we think they should do kind of influence and take space or hold space in the therapy room because when we don't recognize what someone else wants and their goals, it's really hard to guide them in the direction that's right for them. Absolutely. And I will say that in my experiences of working in person-centered planning, it's been so eye-opening how many times I have said to someone, we want to talk about what you want. And they can't even articulate that because no one's ever asked them. So we have to spend time massaging that narrative about this truly is about what you want. And it can be something tiny, like I'd like to have my own bedroom, to something big, like I'd like to be an astronaut. And we figure out what pieces of that we can support them to make happen. I well, I didn't think about how difficult it can be to articulate your goals when no one's ever given you the space or chance. A lot of times within different cultures or just different environments, children are often kind of silenced and expected to follow what their parents want for them. I know growing up, it was like, you should be a lawyer, you should be a doctor, <laughs> and it's not going to be either. And I still hear it to this day, by the way, my parents are still like, go to law school. And it's really, really difficult when no one gives you the space to recognize yourself as a human being with your own wants and needs and goals. And it took me honestly struggling and ending up in a psych ward when life wasn't completely planned out and one thing changed to recognize that I had a voice and I could have my own goals and that was okay. And imagine if you were a person who had grown up in a very disenfranchised environment, or you had been institutionalized for many, many years, where no one ever, they don't ask you what you want for dinner. (laughs) They, you know, everything is prescribed and it's all professional expertise. And you're just supposed to go along with whatever you're being told to go along with. And then someone comes in and says, we want to talk about what you want. It truly is. It, it's, it's such, it's almost a spiritual experience to watch someone blossom and to begin to say, I don't like carrots. I would rather have salad. And that might be the first thing you get. And then as you work with that person and get to know them and they realize you really mean this and that they actually can make decisions, their decisions grow and their goals grow and their universe expands. That is incredible. I don't think how many of us realize how different the playing field is for so many people and how just being able to articulate, I don't like carrots, can seem so small and dismissive to so many people listening. But it is so important to recognize how many people just have never had the opportunity, like you said, to even choose what they want for dinner. It truly is. Um, I think my life has been so enriched. Right? You know, People will say to me, oh, you spend so much time doing good. That's not it. My life is so enriched from the experiences of working with these very, very vulnerable folks and helping them carve their own path and then watching them navigate that path with the supports they need, but to move forward from being in a situation where they were just listening to what everyone else said and adhering to their rules to actually setting up their own boundaries and their own goals and making their own decisions. Yeah, that just sounds like the most amazing and rewarding work. 
in the world. You are incredible. <laughs> Thank you. Another thing you mentioned is just your journey as like with lived experience as a parent and being able to help your son. What are some of the kind of you mentioned the systems and navigating the different systems? What are some of the systems maybe that you had to navigate and what do you wish people knew about them? Our systems are so, so fractured. Um, we try to break a child's life up into pieces and we say, this piece of you belongs to the mental health world. This piece of you belongs to the juvenile justice world. This piece of you belongs to the intellectual challenges world. Rather than bringing those systems together and saying, this is a whole person and we're going to combine our efforts and, and holistically help this person to move forward. Our systems just, we aren't able to do that. There are very, very few states that have been able to get rid of those silos, break those down, and really listen to families and their children and learn. I mean, we know our families are the experts. There never in my child's life was there a day that I wasn't the expert. And it wasn't because I'm a psychologist. It was because I was his mother. I lived with him 24 seven, which other than his dad and I, nobody else did. So it's, but I will have to say with all of my professional credentials, um, we lived in a wonderful zip code. You know, he, he had all of the benefits of a white upper middle class child. Navigating those systems was so difficult. And part of the issue, and this is curious, if a child comes to a system and they are Medicaid eligible, there are so many supports available for them. We've actually done quite a good job. But if you're a family with private insurance, none of that exists. And that was one of, that was probably my biggest aha was, wow, look at this. If we were in the federal space with Medicaid, there would be case managers and all of these other things that would be so helpful in navigation. But in the in the private space, unfortunately, we are still working with our private insurance companies and helping them to understand that there is such a desperate need for more support that isn't clinically diagnosed. It's it's just that support that a family needs. Yeah, it blows my mind how difficult private insurance companies are. I know something we're learning is how many therapists don't want to take insurance because they make it so complicated. They require a diagnosis and then they still may only cover a couple of sessions a year and they don't want to add anything extra like a case manager, some follow-up care, access to different resources that may cost money. And no matter how much opportunity you have to be able to pay for it, it is very expensive. It's very yes. difficult to find. And when insurance companies can, you can go on their website and find primary care physicians that they cover in your area. There should be more access like that for various different types of mental health care. You are exactly right. As you know, the National Federation is one of the leaders in family peer support. Um, I am working tirelessly with our private insurance companies to get them to understand that needs to be a part of their portfolio. It is not a clinical service, but it is one of the most important things a family can have because that's someone who has lived experience, they've walked this walk, and they can help a family to navigate those systems. Plus, if you're a mom, you want to talk to another mom. If you're a dad, you want to talk to another dad. If you're a grandmother, you want to talk to another grandmother. And slowly but surely, I'm working with actually several private insurance companies right now that are really understanding this. And we are moving forward, but we have so far to go. We really do. And that's such a great point that moms or dads or grandmothers 
they want to talk to someone that can relate to their situation. Because like you said, they're experts in their own kid's life. But it's also really difficult to know what to do in the middle of it because you love your loved one so much. Right? My mom always said that the hardest part is she wanted to fix everything for me, but didn't know where to start or what to do. And there was so much she couldn't do. And if she had someone who could just talk to her, another mom who'd maybe gone through it and say, these are some resources out there. This is something that actually helped me as a caregiver to be able to support myself too, because it's very draining on the caregiver, especially when you feel overwhelmed and don't know where to start. So I just think that it's so incredibly important that we create that peer support network. So people don't feel like they're going through it alone. So many people struggle and yet so many people feel isolated because of that disconnect. You are exactly right. And think about the difference in in support needs for a 25-year-old mom or a grandmother who is raising their grandchildren. Their needs are, are very different. And if I can hook up a grandmother with another grandmother who has done the same thing and been successful and had lots of mistakes and they can learn from those mistakes together. It's just such a rich experience. And families tell us all the time that their peer support worker is one of the most important people in their lives. Plus, as you know, as you're majoring in clinical psychology, you know what our workforce looks like right now. There are not enough clinicians to go around. And most of those clinicians don't have lived experience. So by bringing in these folks who are non-clinical, but they are experts in raising successful children who are experiencing challenges, we just, we enrich families' lives so much that way. We really do. It's so amazing to be a clinician, to be a licensed therapist, to have all of this clinical training, but there is another aspect of value in lived experience and feeling that empathy and that connection on a deeper level where you actually get it. You've been there. You know what those emotions are like, and you're able to offer a type of validation, first of all, just that simple validation of I've been here too. I understand that feeling. It can get better. There are tools available. It just means so much when someone who's gone through it too can really relate and connect. I agree. And, you know, it is it is different than our folks who are clinical. We need our clinical folks. I mean, they are so important. But, I mean, just think about something simplistic. And this has been going on since time started. Think about when moms have new babies and their baby won't breastfeed. And they can't figure it out. Well, what did they do? They go to someone else who has raised, you know, who has gone through that and been successful and can tell them, oh, you need to do this. You need to do that. First of all, don't get so tense. You know, all of the things that a peer can tell them that a a nurse may not be able to because they may not have children. So the value of lived experience and the value of peer support is just, it's so underrated. And and one of the things that the Federation continues to do is to highlight this. We highlight this in uh, legislation we support. We highlight this obviously at our conference every year. And we highlight this throughout the year and all of the trainings and technical assistance that we do, we truly want people to become very comfortable with the value of peer support. It's incredible how much you all do for peer support because, I mean, just like you said, when a new mother's breastfeeding and it's not working and they reach out to a peer because their peers have probably talked about it, right? Because it's not stigmatized. So there's like this open network of people you can reach out to who've gone through it and you know that they've gone through it and that's okay. But when it comes to mental health, first of all, it's so stigmatized. A lot of people in your local community and your local network may not talk about it, which can make it feel so isolating. So having access to a resource of people who've gone through it where it doesn't have to be 
shameful or a secret can really help. It can make the difference between someone never accessing services or getting help to someone's entire life changing because they weren't alone in it. Agreed. And I think at the most extreme example, it could be the difference in life and death. Yeah. Because if, if families don't know where to reach out for help for their child or their loved one, whoever it is, and if the help they get isn't really the help they need, you know, I, I mean, we've all seen stories of what happens sometimes. And we don't ever want that to happen if we can help it. We want all of our children to grow up healthy and to reach their goals. And I just feel that peer support is essential in that journey. It really is. And it's a key component of prevention. Our system tends to be not just so disenfranchised, but also so reactive. So reactive, we wait till someone is barely hanging on to be like, oh, you can now access therapy sessions at right. an affordable rate. And you can access maybe more than 10 a year. And if we had access to resources, that just connected us in the right direction. So we could figure out where to start a lot earlier and sooner until it gets to that. But way before it gets to that point can really, like you said, make that difference between life and death. And and just the simplistic idea of enhancing the quality of life for a child and their family. I mean, we sh in our hearts, we know this. I think in our heads sometimes, we let complexities get in the way because we all want all children to have great outcomes. Uh, no one's going to say, oh, no, I don't want those kids to have good outcomes. We all want that. And when we oh, when we look at the news and the media talks constantly about how this person has mental illness that has caused this chaos, whatever the situation is, the one thing we know that all of those adults have in common is that they were all children at one point. And if we could reach them in childhood and support their families and support their journey, think how different life could be. Yeah, so different. That quality of life can be completely enhanced. And the media, we tend to villainize mental health a lot in the media. And when we see something happen, I mean, if we see someone who loses their life, it tends to be what happened, how it happened, when it happened, but not access to resources. There's nothing really being talked about warning signs. That's a great opportunity to start talking about warning signs, start talking about different resources that are available and how you can find those resources. It's not an appropriate time to start giving people the means that someone used. It's an right. appropriate time to give resources. Yes. Um, our media, unfortunately, gets very excited about the way chaos happens. Um, what caused this chaos to happen in terms of, you know, was it a gun? Was it a knife? Was it a did whatever? I mean, it's all that that gritty stuff that really has no importance to a story. And yet there is still this person who is dealing with some significant mental health challenges that we aren't even looking at. Um, one of the things that I find interesting, the media will say, okay, there was a mass shooting today, which has become a buzzword for us. And 10 people were killed. And, and then the shooter was also killed. They talk about 10 victims. There really were 11 victims. And we just do not seem to have the grace to realize that, that that person who committed this very, very unspeakable act, in most cases, is as great a victim as the, the unfortunate people that were, were caught up in the situation. Yeah, a victim of a broken society or a broken system that's not giving them access to those resources and support early on. There are so many times that people can trace back to there was warning signs. There were warning signs, but there was no intervention. There was no support. There was no resources. And how many of these huge tragedies and heinous crimes could be prevented 
had we given people access to resources, had we talked about it, how we not made people feel so isolated and alone in it till it got to that point. I agree. And I, I just don't know. Our society is so enamored with the next big thing. And the bigger the story, the more people are going to read it. And I wish, I personally wish our media could begin to step back and go back to the days of responsible journalism. And let's not have reality television on the news every night. Let's actually begin to look into these stories and determine what resolution we can come up with. What are solutions? What what can we as a society do? Not how what's the body count and and how did that happen? Yeah, absolutely. On the note of solutions, of resolutions, of things we can do and things we can change, the National Federation of Family has that children's mental health acceptance week every year, which I was lucky to be part of one year and it was it's just such an amazing, amazing thing. Can you talk a little bit more about what it looks like each week and what this year's theme is? I am happy to talk about that. Uh, yes, uh, it started out as Children's Mental Health Awareness Week. And it actually, uh, this has been going on for uh, way, way before I got here, for about 30 years. And it started with our affiliate in Missouri. And it was a local grassroots thing, and it just exploded across the country. And now we have amazing partners who work with this. It's a very national event, which is very exciting. What we do, you know, May is Mental Health Month, and we take that first week of May and we say, okay, let's let's think about children. We'll think about other folks as the month goes on, but let's think about children. And um, we decided two years ago that awareness, that's, it's a good first step, but it's so passive. So we decided that we were going to move towards acceptance because that's what we all want for our children. No matter what their age is, we want them to be accepted. And this has become our platform. And along with that, we believe that this acceptance leads to social justice for our families and their children. Um, our society is very inequitable when it comes to mental health. Um, the supports that are available in one community are not even available in another community. And the capacity of supports are very different. So we feel that it's out part of our mission to bring to the country as a whole the notion of we've got to accept these children and their families. If we do that, then we begin to stand behind them. And that leads to what will be our next platform, which is action. So we're going from awareness to exception to action. Um, with our families. It has caught on incredibly well. I think people, as, as I've talked to families and talked to other organizations, we've done all the awareness we can do. It's really time to accept each and every one of our children and families and, and move towards action. Yes, it's so incredible. Awareness is important. We need to be talking about it but we need to take it further than just talking about it. It's not enough to know people are struggling. It's time to accept what is happening, accept each individual as an individual and start looking for ways we can make change, ways we can make a difference and social justice. Like you said, it's so inequitable for so many people, different support. I think COVID really did a good job of showing that I remember when therapy went telehealth and the first time there was a lot of conversation or for the first time that I had seen and my friends had seen a lot of conversation on how many people didn't have access to computers or Wi-Fi that had a strong enough bandwidth to support a telehealth platform. And for the first time, a lot of people got to see how not everyone has the same 
playing field. They're not everyone's not on the same playing field. Therapy might be an option that is technically available to everyone, but doesn't mean everyone has the ability to access it. And that access is important. Absolutely. During the pandemic, we did a couple of surveys with families across the country. And the title of this particular survey was, how are the children doing really? We got, it was so interesting because like all surveys, lots of multiple choice questions. And then we had space for people to write in anything else they wanted us to know. I have never seen so many responses that were written into a survey. And the responses were heartbreaking. Um, families who had, as you said, no internet ability, so they were totally isolated. Um, there was no therapy available for them or their children. Their children couldn't even get the support that was available to most kids who had internet capacity. They were getting no educational outcomes. Families were spending hours and hours working with their children. It was it was really so eye-opening to see how many families across the country were in situations where they were just hanging on by a thread and really not certain. I mean, we had some families, as sad as it sounds, and it's not dramatic, it is their belief that they didn't know that they could hold on. And and actually a couple who said, I think I'm done. I think, you know, I can't, I can't continue. And that's, that's never what you want to hear from a family. No, and that's why the work you're doing is so incredibly important because Again, it's not enough to just talk about this. We need action, we need change, and we need resources and support. And it starts with, honestly, the work you're doing is where it's starting, and it's so incredible. Well, we we truly are dedicated. I mean, we're a relatively small staff, but one thing that is a little bit unique about us is that all of the folks on our team bring some lived experience to the table. So it's not that they have just learned about this from um, other sources, they have lived it. And I think it makes us a very rich team because anyone on our team at any time can say, I've been there. And it's different things, their lived experience is different. But we have such a wide variety of lived experience that if we hear from a family, there's someone I can hook them up with just on our team. And then we have about 120 affiliates across the country uh, in large communities, in tiny communities that we can say, let us hook you up with the support where you live. And that's that's an amazing feeling to be able to do that. And that just shows your dedication to the whole concept and meaning of peer support, of making sure that people are connected to someone who really understands on such a deep level and ensures that people aren't alone in it. Because like you said, it is terrible to hear from a family that they don't want to hold on, that they think that there's no other option. So to be giving people that connection and that support that they're not alone in it and that it can get better and living proof that support is available that resources are available and that there is a brighter tomorrow genuinely makes all the difference I agree and it is what makes the work we do some days it's it's it is a burden because you talk with so many families and and you carry that burden on your shoulders but the joy and the satisfaction far outweighs those days. Um, just, you know, being able to see a family begin to thrive and, and then to want to help another family. I mean, that's like the best because you know that you in some small way put that family in touch with the support they needed and now they want to give back. It's a chain reaction and it's 
incredible. A lot of people, I think, undervalue the impact that they can make on one person and how much further that can go. It's the butterfly effect. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining me today. As we are wrapping up, can you tell us how people can learn more about Children's Mental Health Acceptance Week and get involved? Absolutely. We would love to have as many people involved as possible. Uh, Probably the best way to learn more about it is to go to our website, which is F. F-C-M-H dot org, Federation Families, Children's Mental Health dot org. And the information is there. Uh, All kinds of ways to get involved are included there. And, you know, it takes a village. And the larger our village gets, the more our tent expands, the more families and children will be able to support. Thank you so much for listening to Normalize the Conversation. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. This podcast is an initiative of Inspiring My Generation. Focusing on normalizing the conversation, bringing education and awareness to the forefront, and amplifying global voices to spark change and hope. Inspiring My Generation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization on a mission towards suicide prevention through awareness, conversation, education, and support. Connect with us on Instagram at inspiringmygeneration and visit our website inspiringmygeneration.org to learn more about our work and how you can make a difference.